happening here in the valley? I was part of a mapping team for the USGS. Uh, we started mapping here in 1975, mm -hmm. the upper end of the valley, um, and then worked our way down over a, over a couple of years, also working to the north in the, um, in the Wenatchee Valley. Sure. So we ended up producing a map. I was the sufficial geologist, which means mapping the gravel and sand and glacial moraines and mm -hmm. landslides and things like that. And they're all over this uh, map area. And of course, here in Kittitas Valley, there's this, there's this fill of sediment out there. So we're trying to map that and discovered a few fault scarps and things of that nature. And, and you were assigned to do this, or this was something that you requested or wanted to do? Well, I had joined the USGS to take on this project. Mm -hmm. So they needed, the project needed, for the project to exist, it needed a sufficient geologist. And I had done my thesis up in the Metau Valley and had been familiar with the Eastern Cascades to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so it was beneficial to them and beneficial to me. I, I wanted, I was living in the East, Eastern United States, and I uh. wanted to get back out here to Washington and, right. and back into the Columbia Valley. And, adjacent areas. And that was essentially the start of your USGS career then, starting here in, in the valley essentially? Uh, uh, yes, well I had, a, I had a little session in Antarctica before, uh -huh. that was a temporary assignment in, mm -hmm. that, in that case, but yes, as far as my permanent employment, it was mapping, mapping the, uh, we, we began mapping in the Yakima Valley, including Kittitas Valley. So I'm <coughs> curious how that works, you, you're, you're assigned to come to the Kittitas Valley in the lower Yakima and, and you're supposed to start mapping surficial deposits, is there any base mapping that you're working with, any previous work? Well, you, 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 well if, there is, if there is previous work, of course you take advantage of it, sure. yes, there are, there are reports going back to the 1890s, you know, um, some of them are pretty sketchy, you know, after, after some decades, others are much more specific in smaller areas. Oh. So for instance, Steve Porter at the University of Washington had mapped the glacial geology up valley from here. Mm -hmm. And so that was, although it wasn't published yet when I started, it was, it was a, I knew the history and had some, some partial maps mm -hmm. of it. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, starting from scratch. Does anything stick out in your memory? I know this is more than 30 years ago now, but that time, this is uh, months of work uh, here in the valley, or we well, just a couple of weeks maybe? Oh no, it's more than a couple of weeks, but it uh -huh. wasn't months either. Yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's hard because you're working in other areas. You know, we had all this uh, alpine oh, yeah. terrain to cover too. So sure. in, the, in the summer, you start off in the summer and you're working the high country. And, yeah. and uh, I moved down here uh, in, into to Ellensburg to map the valley late in the season, so it was like October, November. Hmm. In those days when I was young and didn't have so many commitments of family <laughs> and dogs and cats and all this kind of stuff, yeah. uh, I'd spend as much as five or six months in the field. So it was a lot of field work. Well, it's, it's been great to follow your work, and it's, it's more, than, more than 30 years, maybe more than 40 years now of, of mapping uh, up here in the Northwest. And, and I, you, I hate to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to bring that <laughs> up. Um, you're probably best known for your Ice Age floods contributions, and we're certainly going to get there in a second, but there, there was a, a, a St. Helens chapter as well. You were with the USGS in the 70s. Yeah, well, um, I was living in Menlo Park, which is the West Coast headquarters for the USGS, and commuting up to Washington and spending four or five, six months in the field. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of time away from home. I really wanted to live in Washington, but there wasn't really the opportunity. And, so Mount St. Helens eruption was my ticket out of California and to, to move back up here. <laughs> so yes, when I had the opportunity to participate in that, I, I took it and, uh, and f for a while commuted to, the Mount, to, to Vancouver, Washington and Mount St. Helens, but then uh, moved up and have been here since 1981 in the state of Washington. Well, give us a little bit more of that because there's certainly high drama involved. So May 18th is the event, the main event, you're arriving before May 18th? Yes, the, the volcano started having, the earthquake started beneath the volcano in late March, um, about the 20th, 16th mm -hmm. or 20th of March. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the first little eruption happened on the 27th of March, um, surprising even the USGS. But, 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 the, but then suddenly they wanted people to, who were interested in uh, helping with the situation. So I came up <clears throat> with another person from Menlo Park and we stayed here about six weeks, and then people rotating in and out of offices. Yeah. So kind of a well, makeshift arrangement. It sounds well, like. it was you know you you have a things you've said you were going to do and are getting paid to do, so you can't just go off and do something else, uh, uh, even if it's important. Mm -hmm. um, so I was at, back in Menlo Park in California on May 18th, but came up during the day and and stayed another you know two months or so. Mm. Uh, 
And, and, and from that involvement, I got more involved in Mount St. Helens and became sort of a permanent thing. And I moved up, became part of the team in Vancouver. And, um, and as a surficial geologist, what was your contribution before and after the event? Well, you know, I'm a sedimentologist and geomorphologist. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, when something new happens off the volcano, this big landslide and this surge that ran off across the landscape, which did most of the killing, and, and many other phenomena, and they produce new deposits with new shapes. So I just simply took the, what I'd learned from, uh, by studying glacial deposits and, and alluvial deposits um, and applied them to Mount St. Helens. Were you out in the field on May 19th, as quickly as that? I mean, you flew up from the Bay Area. Yeah, well, yes, I flew up and then um, arrived in the afternoon, and, you know, the sort of pandemonium. And, oh, my gosh, And yes. uh, we were, our, our man, David Johnson, it wasn't certain that he was gone yet, but, we, you know, so there was a lot of gloom around the office, oh, too. Oh, sure. And, and it became apparent during the day that other people had been nailed. So uh, it was, you know, it was a tragic situation unfolding. Um, I, by telephone to um, fire departments and so on, I found that, Ashfall it was still going on across eastern Washington, uh, including here in Ellensburg. But uh, there were places to the north of Mount St. Helens and, and more to the, in the in the Collitz Valley that had had ashfall in the morning, uh, but had had ceased by by early afternoon or mm. late afternoon. So mm -hmm. I, if I could get up there, then I could start sampling the ash. So I set out, but got trapped behind two bridges because of floods. Yeah. So I ended up watching a giant flood come down the come down the Collitz past. Mm -hmm. um, Castle Rock. Mm -hmm. um, the cops were guarding the bridge. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't let me across, but they had to go off and go to the bathroom or something. Anyway, they were gone at some point at midnight, <laughs> and so I, I ran the bridge at 1 a.m., and uh, when, oh. which turned out to be when the flood was at its height. Oh, and, I, my and, I, and I indeed got up to the Collis Valley between 2 and 4 a.m. And, and did my sampling under the headlights. So, This is Indiana Jones stuff. Well, Indiana anyway, <laughs> I, I wanted to get up there, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, exciting, exciting. Um, Let's switch gears, Ice Age floods. I love the story of how you kind of first got interested in the Ice Age floods. You were talking about driving regularly to your field site in the Matau looking at glacial deposits. Yes, and that, so this was in the early 70s, like 70, 1970 and 71. And mm -hmm. at that time, the North Cross Highway didn't exist yet. It was being built, mm -hmm. but, it, but it wasn't open. So mm -hmm. the way you got to the Matau Valley from uh, from Seattle, from the University of Washington, was over Stevens Pass by US 2 to Wenatchee and then up the east side of the river on Old, what's now Alternate 97 to Chelan and, and the Metau. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have enough discipline to get to my thesis area, so, <laughs> so I couldn't keep the blinders on. The Columbia was so interesting, I just, I would spend a day or two coming and going working in the Columbia. Um, Towards the end of the work in the Metau, though, an another thing that really caught my eye there was uh, all of the geology of the Metau, the glacial geology, mm -hmm. was a record of the ice sheet coming down the valley over the high mountains. Uh, it came into the Chelan Trough and then back out of the Chelan Trough into the Metau, into the Twisp, and all of this ice coming down to the mouth of the Columbia. So it had all these, all these crisp crystalline rocks in it from the North Cascades, mm -hmm. sedimentary and crystalline rocks. Mm -hmm. Down the very lower end of the valley were some very large uh, basalt boulders. So I wondered, uh, is, was, is this a place where the Okanagan lobe, the one that come down the Okanagan Valley and, and, and down towards the Metau, had the Metau Glacier backed up and then this uh, Okanagan Glacier yeah. come in. Yeah. But I could never find any till, you know, any basaltic till to go with those basaltic rocks. Mm -hmm. it, it, they were sitting right on the crystalline rock till of the Metau Glacier. Yeah. So as if they had been let down on the end of a string. It was so, it was so weird. And eventually, you know, racking my brain to coming, coming up, trying to come up with the explanation for them. And it wasn't just one or two. There were several, there were quite a number of these things. Sure. It became evident that the only way you could explain them is if they came floating in on ice, in other words, in a big flood. Huh. So I had some evidence in the uh, mouth of the Metau, and I just started looking around more, and I was still r relatively oblivious to uh, J. Harlan Bretz's work since the 1920s at Eastern Washington, so I started reading a lot more. And... Um, and Let me interrupt you right there. That's yeah. interesting to me. So we're the early 70s, and what is now presented as this major revolution in, in thinking of the Pacific Northwest and accepting mm -hmm. Bretz's ideas maybe as early as the late 50s and early 60s, you're saying that you as a graduate student still weren't locked well, into these famous Ice Age features well, the, then? Well, Bretz's, you know, Bretz's uh, 
bailiwick was was in the east. It was it was kind of Grand Coulee and farther east. Yes. And I'm up in the northwest corner yeah, of the Metau. You're in and that section of the Columbia. Brett's didn't think it was flooded. I mean, it was. Uh, oh he, really? He, he had no knowledge of anything. So I guess it's one of the reasons I was. There were these. Not, not much was written about the, the, the section of the Columbia that I happened to be going up and down. And uh, if Brett's had written about it, I would have known more about sure. it. Sure. But he didn't. And so I just uh. didn't pay much attention to that which ah. was off and not relevant to what mm -hmm. I was doing in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And so when I started finding this flood thing, then of course I started reading more of Brett's and wondering, well, you know, could this stuff actually have gotten here? Huh. So, yeah, so Brett's did, you know, he did a fantastic job, you know, of, of breaking this, this uh, unprecedented story in mm -hmm. eastern Washington and mm -hmm. Channel Scabland, but he didn't get to everything. You know, it's a huge area, and he, he, he messed up here and there. He, he had blind, spot, blind spots, as every scientist does. Sure. He could take a story so far, but not beyond. We, we, right. we, all, we, all have these, uh, we all have these skills and limitations, and he had them too. So he didn't, he didn't get the part of the story that I stumbled into. Mm -hmm. And so he left something for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's an interesting approach to the flood story. You're coming in from the margins, essentially, right? And, you, and, you, and you're working yes, your way towards... Yes, literally the margins, yeah. the northwest margin. Right. And, and I can't let this go. I've got to keep with this just a little bit. So you're studying at the UW under Porter. Was there a lot of talk of Brett's and his work? Or were you so confined to the, the, the Cascade well, Alpine areas that you weren't paying the, much attention? I don't, I don't remember much uh, discussion of Brett's. Huh. Um, in retrospect, I um, in retrospect I find this rather surprising. Yes. You know, um, uh, I, I don't. You know, each each classroom and each individual is kind of a somewhat of an island too. So I don't know what was going on in general. I don't think there was much discussion of these yeah. big floods, though. Yeah. It just yeah. wasn't a current topic. I think it had been settled to the extent it was going to be, and it was mm -hmm. old hat, and it wasn't new new research, mm -hmm. and nobody was working in it then. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great springboard into into your contribution to the Ice Age flood story. So you get interested, approaching from the margins, and then you become a major player in the research, along with Vic Baker and, and others. Um, your main, how would you characterize your main contribution to the Ice Age floods research? Well, there's two of them. You know, part of the, st the next part of the story is, is, is this project with the USGS, mapping this, this um, Wenatchee, one to 100,000 quadrangle, and the next one to the north, the yeah. Chelan quadrangle. And down the east side of those two map sheets was the Columbia Valley. So I did finally get a chance to map in the Columbia, you know, on time and get paid for it and yeah. all of that. Yeah. And to, to make a geologic map, you cannot leave white areas. I mean, you must, if the, the, the discipline of mapping forces you to get around, see everything, and come to grips with it. So I was, you know, purposely making sure I, I got to everything and, and saw it. Of course, we had aerial photographs, and it was a, that's a great tool to um, understand things you won't necessarily see sure. by walking on the ground. Yeah. And I discovered a gigantic bar at, at Wenatchee, I mean, an absolutely huge bar where the airport is, mm -hmm. uh, Pangborn mm -hmm. Airfields on, on top of it. And there are other bars... Previously unrecognized? Yes, it hadn't been recognized mm -hmm. as a flood bar. Um, and then started finding exposure. So the, the, the exposure, besides that flood, the, the big flood bar indicated there had been one, at least one immense monstrous flood down the Columbia. In fact, uh, the ice rafted erratics above the level of the bar go up another several hundred feet. So, and the, the valley itself, the past Wenatchee, has, does not seem to have been deep in any, little if any, uh, since, the, since the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell that from the way sediments are on the valley. Um, so the water coming past Wenatchee at a fairly steep gradient of seven feet per mile was 1,100 feet deep. I mean, so this was huge. I mean, this is huger than anything I'd write about anywhere on, on Earth, including the Channel Scabland. And so, un unrecognized by Brett, that particular yes, section. Right, he okay. didn't, yeah, his, so here's the old master, didn't re recognize water in the Wenatchee area, and it's pouring down there 1,100 feet deep. Yeah, yeah so that, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, other, the other big thing in that area was the mouth of Moses Cooley. There was a big bar, there is a big bar, and it has quite a few beds in it. Um, they had come out of Moses Cooley uh, because they're basaltic. Um, the, the Columbia Valley for, uh, from the north has got all of these crystalline rocks in it and sedimentary rocks, so mm -hmm. bright colored gravel. Mm -hmm. Anything coming from the east across the Columbia Plain, Columbia Plateau, is basaltic. Yeah. And so stuff coming out of, the gravel coming out of Moses Cooley was basaltic. So you could easily recognize where it came from. It, it, it had come into the Columbia from Moses Cooley and not down the Columbia past Wenatchee. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Moses Cooley was dammed off during most of the flood history because of the Okanagan lobe had covered the upper end of the Cooley, so water couldn't get into it. And yet it obviously is a flood cut huge Cooley. Sure. It's second in grandeur only to Grand, Grand Cooley. It really is. Um, at the mouth of Moses Cooley, I could find five gravel beds separated by finer, uh, finer sediments. And um, some of them were so fine, it was clear that the water had actually stopped in between. So here is evidence that it, at the mouth of Moses Cooley, there had been not just one flood, but two or even five, down a Cooley that had been blocked off during most of the history of the flood. So, so this was another eye-opener. And pre previous to working with those deposits, you were a one flood person. Well, you, yes, you, mm -hmm. you, you. Um, there's a principle called Occam's razor, where you shave your interpretation down so that it's no more elaborate than the evidence allows. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, I didn't have any evidence for more than one big flood. Mm -hmm. That big, that huge bar in Wenatchee that I recognized, and some a few other features. I knew there was one monster down there, but there wasn't any evidence to interpret it any other way. Sure. That, um, then the, the mouth of Moses Cooley bar, the Rock Island bar, um, opened that up a little bit. Yeah. The next phase in that, though, is, is um, after having led a GSA field trip with Vic Baker, where we kind of built the story of one or two floods. I needed two floods because I needed at least one from Moses Cooley. Right. A week later, I was down in the Walla Walla Valley with a colleague uh, looking at what we thought might be fault scarps in the valley. What year is this, uh, roughly? This would be 1977, 77. fall of 77. Okay. And, um, and w as we're doing this geology in the valley, there was this canyon out in the middle of the valley. You know, what in the earth is that doing there? So we went over and found it, and it was a, uh, a huge cut that had been done by, a, by a, a, an irrigation ditch that had got away in the 1920s and cut this huge ditch. Um, I call it Burlingame Ravine now. Mm -hmm. And exposed about um, uh, 40 beds, uh, 40 graded beds. Um, up near the top, uh, uh, three quarters of the way up, there was uh, Mount St. Helens ash on top of mm -hmm. one of these beds. And um, I spent, you know, about 50 minutes just simply staring at that bed because if these were all deposited during one flood, which was the story, how could that, that, that ash layer, in fact, it was a dual a, a pair of ash layers, mm -hmm. that, that can't be here. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. And I sort of mentally went through what, what had to happen. It made no sense. And... I didn't have time to pursue this, but the, the next field season, which is the spring of 78, I came yeah. up and, w and made a beeline for, <laughs> for that place and, yeah. and did a, measured a detailed section and, and started finding all kinds of other evidence that indeed each one of these beds was separate maybe. In other words, each bed, each of these 40 beds represented a separate flood. Mm -hmm. So it's, although the story started at the mouth of Moses Cooley, uh, it, there was, it was such a bizarre piece of evidence at the time. It didn't right. fit anything else. Right. That, I almost ignored it for a while, and then, and then this this part of the story uh, opened up, and then you know, that, and then that was just still just one exposure in the Walla Walla Valley. Mm -hmm. But then looking around, there's another exposure, and then another, and um, I drove up the Yakima Valley with my eyes open and found several others. So it was it, it suddenly became a regional story, um, and and everywhere you looked with your eyes open, you could see evidence uh, sure. of large numbers of floods. So you went from one to maybe a handful, possibly at the mouth of Moses Cooley. So now you're up to Suddenly up 40. to 40, yeah. And, um, and then so I just basically drove the region. I found an exposure over near Missoula, Montana. They had 40 beds in it and one in the uh, partway down the Willamette Valley, which is, another, which is a back-flooded valley in the lower Columbia, um, uh, down south of, south of Oregon City. Yeah. That had 40 beds in it. So I published a paper, you know, 40 floods and the, the ink wasn't even dry yet when it was 52 and then 60 something <laughs> eventually uh, Brian Atwater raised the number to 89 because yes. uh, we, we learned to count better as time went on and more exposures became available so uh, there's nothing magical in the number 40 although it still sticks in people's head it was just yeah. simply the first number sure. uh, of, of, of more than more than two let's say did you yourself have a little mini Brett's experience where you were pushing something and conventional wisdom was no, and, and so there was a, a solitary voice against this chorus, or not, that's way well, too dramatic for is, what you were doing? As a matter of fact, yes, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people felt this idea was wild. People had seen these rhythmic sediments before. Right. I mean, Brett's had seen them and didn't know what to do with them. Huh. And uh, the, the old idea, Brett's, Brett started the idea, and then Vic Baker developed it, and other people 
um, seem to agree with it. Uh, there wasn't necessarily a lot of literature on this, but, to, but what there was, the idea is that, um, you know, when, when water is disturbed in a basin, it can slosh back and forth, a process called seaching. So if Pasco Basin, uh, a lot of flood water is coming into it, and it either comes in in pulses, or uh, something gets set up to, to get it sloshing, then, then the seaching can take place, and can seesh into, uh, in and out of Walla Walla Valley. So that was the explanation. Uh, it wasn't understood, but some sort of mm. irregularities during the course of one big mm -hmm. flood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brett's never saw this big exposure that I mentioned in Walla Valley, but, but he did see others and saw the rhythmic bedding. So he knew about it and mentioned it and, and, and basically asked. He said, surely, surely uh, each bed can't represent a separate flood. And there must be some sort of pulsation taking place during the flood. But in your time in the late 70s and even into the early 80s, then you were taking people to Burlingame and, and they were saying, no, I think, still think this is seaching. I still think this well, is Well, uh, you know, it... it uh, geologic field work is like writing a book. It's a solitary endeavor. You know, so I wasn't taking people on field trips. Yeah. It was basically quizzing my own mind. Right. But eventually you start giving papers, talks at professional meetings mm -hmm. at the Geological Society of America. And um, so you do start sharing the story uh, even before it gets out into the literature. And uh, I, w I was, within a short order, I knew I was really onto something. So I did publish that first paper, which was published in 1980. Yeah. Of course, it takes about two years from the time you initiate a paper to the time it actually right. comes out. Right. So the first paper was 1980. And, and that, you know, it, it, it didn't go down very well with, the, with, with many people, and they thought it was nuts. And so, yeah, but more evidence kept coming along. You bet. Science corrects itself, uh, so so it, it's really in the long run it's, it's the evidence. It's, mm -hmm. the, it's it's the good evidence that's going to determine an argument one way or the other. But it did take many years. I mean, people still arguing against it into the early two thousands. Sure. And um, and but but finally, I think the evidence has convinced. Everybody. I think we're there. I yeah. think we're there now. Yeah. So it's twenty eleven. Are we above eighty nine in your mind? Eighty nine floods. Br the best. The best count is Brian Atwater's work in the Sandpoil Valley and adjacent parts of the Columbia, where he pieced together um, particularly good exposures in, 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 in a way, because, because there's, some, there's some sediments in between the floodbeds there called varves. These are an individual layer produced, um, deposited in a, a, a lake, in, uh, just ordinary, mm -hmm. and, you can, and it's an, a year's worth of sedimentation. They have characteristics, and you sort of count them like tree rings. And because of the characteristics of these varves, he could correlate between, and other beds, he could correlate between one section and another. So he was able to piece together a composite section uh, that came up with this 89 and filled in a blank area low in the section with a core. Mm -hmm. So that's the best count we have mm -hmm. by far in any one small area. Mm -hmm. I think he missed a few at the bottom. I mean, not, not that he didn't do his work well, but in the sense that the, the exposure, the exposure wasn't, wasn't there, or the mm -hmm. core didn't pick it up or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'd, I don't know. It, it's it's hard for me to believe that that big enormous bar at Wenatchee was one flood. It's so enormous. Right. It's so huge. Right. So I'd like to have, I'd like to think of several floods down the valley um, uh, bef before it got blocked off by the ice sheet, uh, not just one. Uh, but I can't prove it. I mean, I really don't have any evidence, uh, any hard evidence. Uh, but I just suspect that there's more than 89 in it. But but I don't think a whole lot more. So I, in round numbers, 95 or 100 floods during the last glaciation. We've got just a couple minutes left. I usually end with this kind of a discussion. The future. You're still working full time, USGS, mm -hmm. I understand. I but am. Let's say I give you a big pile of money and I say, Richard, we got three more years. We want to devote full time to those flood deposits or something, any, any I'd take project. I take your money. Yes, uh, you be, would. Because that's the problem is, is I, it's hard to get any kind of money to work on the story, research grade money. Um, so I would take it, yes. I'm, I'm trying to get money to, to, to work in the floods because I feel as, you know, as much as we know about it, there's still, you know, for every question we've been able to answer, there's, there's 10 other questions. And there's just a lot of work left to do out there. I mean, I feel we've still just scratched the surface huh. of it. So there's plenty of work for students to do. Where, um, would, you, where would you head? Is there one, one field site that you'd want to visit right away? And no, I'm, all these I'm money more of a dates? regional. Yeah, well, the answer is mm -hmm. yes, but there's, no, there's not one, but mm -hmm. there's some places in the Columbia, there's a place in Pasco Basin. Mm -hmm. There's places that hardly have been touched at all. Uh, I'd probably make a beeline for the Telford Crab Creek section, section 
These are places like Wilson Creek that come down from the north and yeah. empty into Upper Crab Creek. Yeah. And that for the, hasn't been really studied very much. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether there's much up there or not, but mm -hmm. I'd just like to fill that in a little bit more sure. with, with knowledge instead of uh, ignorance. So your hunch is there may be more flood deposits that haven't been found, or you're just wanting to work out timing with the existing flood deposits we have? Do you have a Well, it's, it's not so much deposits being found, it's studying them in detail. Uh -huh. So you, you know, to study it, you go out in the field and you spend several days, you measure a section, you sample, you, you, know, you do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. I'm mostly a field person, so I do mm -hmm. everything I can in the field. Mm -hmm. Some people might want to collect and take samples back to the lab and do various things on them, but uh, I think there's lots to do in the field still, and that's what I would do. And getting some age dates from the flood deposits, if you had the cash, you can do more than just get volcanic ash, tephra layers between this, the deposits? Right. Uh, the, the dating of the Missoula floods um, is, is, is particularly sparse. Yeah. But the most recent good field work um, by Jim O'Connor in the Gorge, and that was actually in the 1990s, was published in uh, Jim O'Connor and a colleague, um, Gerardo Benito in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, they published it in 2003. They, they, they found more dates in the Columbia Gorge than we'd found collectively in the rest of the system. Interesting. For, so I think they showed us how to go looking for stuff more. Now, out of all those dates, there's only a few that are really good. Mm -hmm. But still, um, I, I think you, we can learn to look for things that we, we didn't before. Sure. Richard, it was a pleasure chatting with you, and I really appreciate you coming up here to Ellensburg for this. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be part of this. So these floods, are, after all, they're the biggest measured by discharge, they're the, they're the biggest floods we know of on Earth, and so it's a big story and deserves every, everybody. There's so many people interested in it, and I think it deserves a broader audience. I'm with you.